Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Cardboard Box Item Podcast. I am Steve, and I am joined by my good friends, Michael. Yo. And Sean. Hello. And this is my podcast voice, which you might have noticed is very, very <laughs> deliberate, pronounced, and I pronounce all the letters in each word. So anyway, today we are talking about something of a con- controversy that uh, Sony has dumped on our laps. As of uh, March, it was announced that the PlayStation Store on PlayStation 3, PlayStation Vita and PlayStation Portable will be shut down by the end of this summer. Uh, The dates I have here, the PlayStation 3 and Vita are going to be closed on August 27th and the PSP will be shutting down its store on July 2nd, 2021. Yeah, I mean... Rest in peace. Yeah, good. <laughs> <It's, laughs> can we cut that? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I feel like this is worth talking about because, I mean, the funny thing about this is those stores were not something anyone really cared about until we found out they were closing. <laughs> yeah. Well, like maybe well, the vast majority of people didn't care about them. Yeah, I think a lot of people still play like uh, PS Vita and stuff in Japan, especially. Uh, yeah, I've I've never seen anyone playing a Vita here now, except myself. Um, <laughs> oh, there you yeah. go. You were the market, Steve. <laughs> but having said that, like, I don't know, like, I don't have to like stare in through people's like living room window to actually see that. So I don't know. But I've never <laughs> seen anyone playing them out in public. So um, I don't do that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> see, the thing is, like, uh, the PlayStation, the, the fact that these stores are closing is um, may or may not be a big issue because most people probably have the games they want from those stores at this point. I think it's probably safe to assume. Mm. Y- yes. Yes and no. It's weird, but... There's a lot of like PS3 games that I was like, uh, just for reference, I'm living in the UK at the moment and my PS3 is back home in Ireland. So I was half thinking, oh, when I can go back home, I might download some games onto my PS3. But then this news hit and I was sort of like, okay, that's that idea gone. Well, you you still will be able to download games you already own. No, but I mean, like there's some games I wanted to buy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's some stuff that's... Not to jump ahead too much, but the older Final Fantasy games, um, a collection was brought out for the the PS1, and there's a version that you can buy on the PS3 of like all the old ones from the SNES and stuff like that. But now that'll be gone. Yeah, mm. there's like a old collection. I think a lot of them came out in collections on the PS1, like one and two huh. was together and stuff like that. I knew um, one and two was together, and I think there might have been a version with uh, four and five together, mm, maybe. Um, but now, I think the only way to play those, unless you have the original um, Nintendo console and the original game, is like a mobile version, and that's like, just whack. It's just like a not yeah. good way to play it. <laughs> that's that's weird that they're not on the the PS4 store even, are they? No. Well, well no. may, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but like I think the only way to get those is that collection, the original or a mobile version. Are you? Yeah, no, I think you are right on that. Like, um, I think all the games before, prior to Final Fantasy VII, now are like you can probably get them. You can get them on mobile. I know that much. Mm. Uh, I think some of them you can get on the Switch. But yeah, for the most part, yeah, they're just going to be gone now. And actually, JRPGs is a particular sore point for me because there's a couple of games I always thought at some stage I'll buy those. The Mm. Persona games, like the first four Persona games are all on the PlayStation Vita store. And I planned at some stage to get those, but they're really expensive. So uh, I kept putting it off. I have the first one, but now I'm like, oh, if I'm going to get those, I have to get them soon. But um that's if I decide to get them because they're still exceptionally expensive. Mm. But yeah, like uh, now these these are all games that like you said, Michael. If you have them like a physical copy, and that's kind of an issue it's, itself. But like, what the bigger issue is, some of these games don't have physical copies. Some of them are digital only games. And once these stores shut down, that's it. They're gone for good. I think I think it's interesting to know just because I have the numbers here in front of me but out of those three storefronts um 2200 games are digital only Mm. and out of those 120 are not available on any other platform so there's 120 games going to be lost basically when these all close down 
Uh, now, like, comparatively, that's a small number. Um, but, and also, I think, like, just to talk about game preservation as a whole, like, it kind of keeps coming up now and again throughout history. But I think now it's, like, really... It's like it's after the news is after getting so big now because like PlayStation, those three formats are like such major ones, mm. and the fact that they're closing down both their portable console stores, it's like it's like there is plenty of people who still play those consoles and yeah. stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, the fact that 120 games are just going to be gone, and I guess it's going to come down to like possibly the developers and publishers could like uh put them out on other formats if or uh, other hardware or whatever if they mm. wanted to but i guess then there's agreements with sony that they'd have to you know tie up and stuff i don't know that, but that's the worrying thing is that for and we'll probably get into this throughout but for a lot of games it's down to the publisher if they archive them or if they preserve them or port them over to a new system and if it's a really obscure game that no one really bought and there isn't a lot of like fan anticipation for, then they're not going to do it. Yeah, and like that's fair enough. Like it's a capitalist market; they're only going to spend money if there's like a profit out there. But it's scary to think of things getting lost because there could be history there. There could be like some great game designer, his first game for some indie studio is just lost forever. Whereas that's yeah. like a really, in some ways, a really important historical artifact. Yeah, but I'm sure like, um, like even with other media, this has always been an issue. Because like, if you think of films on VHS or whatever. That or even were, back on film. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. That, that were never like um, made digital. Um, then like they're just gone. I mean, unless you have, like they're not selling the videos anymore or whatever. So like, mm. unless you have a copy at home, which eventually will die itself uh, because it's only like, can only last for a finite time, then, you know, you, well, that's gone. That's lost. Um, and then the same with music, I guess, as well, to a degree, like stuff that wasn't digitized back in the day or whatever. And I'm, I'm sure that's all been lost as well. Mm. So I think like the the number of game. Well, yeah, when but bring it to bring it back to games, like the number of games getting lost is just going to increase over time. And um, yeah, I think like just to kind of move on a little bit, like I think game preservation should uh, become a standard really like in some way with uh, publishers and developers because it's like well I guess it's more so down to the developers but like there should be kind of a uh a continuity with these with these games going forward you know a way to save them for like future generations I guess and stuff you mm. know because right now it's just like yeah we made a game buy it if you want and then whatever happens after that it's not our problem do you know like once a developer drops support for something it's like yeah I don't care about that anymore but like I'm sure plenty of the fans do and then like sorry if I'm rambling a bit here but then like you know fans can like and have uh, made efforts to like preserve games as well but then you come into piracy issues with that and you know, it's funny, a developer mightn't care about a game anymore, but as soon as someone pirates it, they're yeah. like, where's my money? You know? yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot to delve into with it, I guess. But um, A big part of it as well is, um, so like preserving games, like you said, is important, not just because like, you know, there's, uh, you know, stuff of value in those games. Like even the really terrible games should be preserved because mm -hmm. like we should be able to learn from those mistakes. You know, there's that famous quote, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. So we might get, you know, another Bubsy 3D coming out in years <laughs> to come if, if we don't have that game, like, on oh, file. God, okay, guys, we have to preserve these <laughs> games. <laughs> have it, actually, just a funny side note, have any heard about Balan Wonderworld? That came out, Yeah, like, apparently it's awful. Oh, it's meant to be terrible, and it costs $60 or whatever, <laughs> and it's, yeah. like, just the worst game ever, but they, like, branded it as, like, oh, this new cool action platform game, and it's just dreadful. And they're still selling it for 60 quid as well. I planned on getting that. I thought that looked really good. Like, the trail, like, obviously it was an early trailer, which you should never pay attention to. But yeah, no, it just looks like such a train wreck. Yeah, terrible. What, what, um, was that made by the guy who made Bubsy or something like that? Or No, I'm not I sure that's, who made That's Square Enix. Square Enix Is made it? that. Yeah. Really? Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, apparently they, they just like... Um, 
kind of copy and paste a lot of stuff in it and like the whole thing is you need to wear like uh, costumes in each level and the costume gives you like abilities but like oh yeah this, this is the thing at the start of the game apparently like you need a certain costume to be able to jump and if you don't have that costume, oh like there's load of, load of levels where you don't have the ability to jump. And it's like, people are like, this is the fucking most annoying thing ever. But like, that seems like it'd be a cool <laughs> mechanic if it was done well, if well, levels were designed well around it. But obviously, like a platformer isn't where a hat, you can't jump. A hat and time as well, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, isn't that like very similar? Don't the hats give you abilities? They do, but you can jump all the time <laughs> as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, note to publishers, this is why we need to preserve these games so that we know this is a dumb idea. Like, I'm kind of, I'm a little bit saddened that um, I don't know if anyone remembers this. You guys might not even remember it. There was this horror game that came out on the PS3, Amy. Like, the yes. worst game ever made. <laughs> and that's going to be gone because that wasn't available on anything except PlayStation oh, wow. 3. And no one's ever going to remember how god awful that game was i still like i download it i have it and i'm like okay great now i can sell this for i don't know maybe it'll be worth something <laughs> you'll have to, to pay come. someone to take it from you <laughs> yeah i would like you know uh et the atari game like mm. is that worth any amount of money now because it was absolutely terrible but uh because I'm not sure is it easy to get your hands on it now. I, you can always go into the landfill that they threw them all into <laughs> and dig up a copy for yourself. Yeah, but that's true. I don't know. I, but your your point is right. Like, we do need to learn and have these, like, disasters documented. But even, like, the small, obscure games that didn't even make a ripple in the pond, you know? Like, there's there's plenty of good stuff there. Like, there's there's so much, like, abandonware and just stuff that has no merit that's like a half completed game but you know there's there's something to be learned from everything there and it's like who gets to decide it shouldn't just be the market that decides which games get to live on do you know what's funny about this actually uh this isn't the first time that this has happened because the wii WiiWare store shut down in 2019 and nobody even knew about it oh wow and were games lost as a result games were lost but the thing is the games were terrible, you know? <laughs> so the um, this isn't the, virtu the virtual console that carried over to the Wii U and that's still going. So, you know, all the Super Nintendo games, mm. Nintendo games, those ones are still available on the Wii U, but the WiiWare games are not. And I was, I looked through the list before this and I think I bought maybe three of them, none of which were particularly good. Uh, I think the best one, the one that had the most acclaim on that list was World of Goo. Do you guys know yeah, that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, that's available on other consoles now. So, you know, that one had some acclaim. So obviously they felt the need to protect it. But hmm. so many games there are just, like you said, shovelware, really bad games. And because nobody cared about them, like I myself didn't really care. There's... Yeah, no, none of the games that I bought, I would even think about again twice. But, uh, but yeah, they're just gone. It's only when the games that you're worried, oh, maybe I can't have this game, which is really good. Like the fact that I couldn't download the Persona games potentially in the future, that's what got me going thinking this is now really important. It's, it's interesting, like when you talk about first party games and say if... Like, I, I guess it's kind of different when it comes to third party, but like with first party games and say Nintendo decides, yeah, we're closing down our shop and, you know, all these games are going to be lost. We don't want to sell them anymore. Tough shit. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, well, you know, they do own the games. Like, I mean, they own the right to sell them and stuff. So yeah. if they don't want to do that anymore, then like, you know, that's kind of okay, I guess. I mean, it sucks for consumers, but like, what can you do about it? True. And that's like sort of what I was saying, like it's it's worrying that the publisher has the right. Uh, but you're right, it's true. If I'm selling buns, hot cross buns, let's say, <laughs> um, and I decide not to sell them anymore, it's like tough shit. I don't want to be in yeah. a bakery all day. So we have to preserve the buns. <laughs> like some preserve moldy buns. buns. <laughs> but where this gets a bit more tricky is games that rely on a server yeah. in order to operate. Um that brings me to, I don't know if you guys know about Ross Scott. He's a YouTuber. He has a channel called Accursed Farms. Um, he's probably most famous for the Freeman's Mind YouTube series, where he plays through Half-Life 1 and narrates uh, what 
what's happening oh. inside uh, Gordon Freeman's mind. That's cool. Um, oh. It's very good. But he has uh, for years been sort of banging the drum about games preservation and how worrying it is that games are being lost forever because there's a lot of games that rely on the central server to operate. Um, the sort of trend, I don't know, 10 years ago was like always online. So you had to be connected to a server even if you downloaded a game. Yeah. And it would have to recognize that you're connected online for the game to operate. Um, Ross actually brought out a video in 2019 um, with a fairly inflammatory title called uh, Games as a Service is Fraud. And uh, wow. he tried to make a case that it's uh, anti-consumer rights for games as a service, um, games to be released that don't have some sort of, you know, afterlife. So yeah. that they don't have some way of preserving them. Um, and like he's fairly open like in that, you know, a game company isn't going to keep a server forever but you should at least if if a game has gone forever and you don't want it anymore release the source code to fans and let them run the server yeah um yeah and some people have done that actually mm. i'm trying i'm trying to think um there's a game i think it's i think it's the original demon souls actually i heard that with the servers for that shut down but then somebody actually now i don't want to say this if i'm not right on it so maybe i should just look this up but, but no, I, I do know what you're talking about. Like they reverse engineered it or something like that, but they set up their own server. There's definitely examples of games like that out there. Like I think uh, a while back there was like the original, uh, I think they call it vanilla World of Warcraft um, servers for like the original yeah. form of that um, online game. Um, that that was fan. That was a fan server. Um, and that sort of preserved that experience. Yeah, like it's probably in the developers or publishers' terms and conditions about this stuff. Of course. But like it does seem completely unfair really to the consumer and wrong because especially for a game that like they've paid full price for and you're making them like connect to a server to be able to use it. Mm. Um, I mean, and then you, at any moment you can just take away their right to play the game. Like it's... Yeah, it just completely seems wrong. And I know with games that let you, or with games that make you like sign into the server before you can play, like it might be a completely offline game, mm. but you just need to like connect to the server once or something. Mm. Um, I think, um, well, I know some like, I guess hackers or whatever have brought out versions or like they've they've released like versions of games where it doesn't need to connect to the yeah, server or you can mod it in some way yeah, that you don't yeah. need to exactly well yeah I suppose for PC versions or whatever mm. but again that kind of falls into piracy a little bit um, but that's what people are going to resort to if they don't make these things available well yeah legally. I, I think there's been especially in the last like 10 years there's been a good enough backlash from consumers that they hate having to do that like always online sign in mm -hmm. thing like when the Xbox One first came out and it was always online yeah. massive backlash and they turned around on it which is really good so mm -hmm. like I think going forward there, there doesn't need to be any need for that like maybe if you want to use online services or social features of a game fine like obviously it needs to connect to a server for that but you should be able to choose if you want to have a completely offline experience. And that way, at least if the server does die or get shut down at some stage, you still have that full offline experience. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, like, that's kind of fair enough. Like, you, like, we have to accept that servers aren't going to stay live forever. Like... There's plenty of um, like games which had great multiplayer, you know, back in the like. Actually, I was just watching um, a video series on Killzone, and the multiplayer servers for two and three are shut down. I think 2018 or 2019 they shut down. Mm. So like now they probably didn't have like massive player bases anyway. But the point stands that you can no longer play multiplayer on them if you wanted to. But the there there was still a huge single player element to that, and actually they both included offline multiplayer where you could play with bots so you could still get the experience mm. just not with on a server which you know i think that kind of stuff needs to become standard obviously it gets more complicated when you talk about games like call of duty modern warfare or fortnite or you something know like yeah, that, yeah like there are, are i mean specifically warzone and stuff mm. like there's no way to play that offline yeah so but that but but then again like fortnite warzone warframe they're all free games so maybe you have to go into that knowing I won't be able to play this forever, you yeah. know? It is a lesson that games are just going to have to learn because it's it's funny that 
they haven't really picked, they still haven't really picked up on this yet. Uh, well, it hasn't been as big as an issue uh, until something like this happens. Like this is the first massive blow to games preservation. I think that we've really had because physical copies never really go anywhere. Like, so if you have physical copies, that's fine. But um, digital copies, that's just it. They're gone. They're in the ether now. Uh, mm. Like films had to learn this the hard way. Uh, like I'm sure you guys like know that there was that, what was it? I think it was Martin Scorsese who said that uh, something like half the films that were made before uh, 19, the 1950s are just lost and don't exist anymore. And something like yeah. 90% uh, before 1929, I think he said, were completely gone. So this is a harsh lesson that the movie industry had to learn. And it's interesting that I don't think the game industry, I think everybody... All the consumers know it, I think. Well, a lot of us know it. Like, it seems very obvious to us, but yeah, I don't know. The thing the thing is, it's becoming like much, it has become much easier now to preserve games, especially in the digital age. Mm. But it's it's all down to money at the end of the day, you That's know? It, yeah. Like, especially when there's only a niche sort of group of people who want to actively play the game. Yeah. Whereas all of us have this sort of, you know, uh, high-minded thing and that we want to preserve all games but like I'm not going to pay for all games to be preserved you know? no but like <laughs> um, personally there's definitely cost-effective ways for publishers and developers to do it though I think like um, like two two come to mind which is Nintendo and Microsoft and they do have an advantage in that they're um, they own platforms themselves and they own digital storefronts mm. but um like Microsoft, for example, with the new Xbox series and more so with Game Pass is, I think I have this right now, but they're like allowing backwards compatibility all the way back to the original Xbox. I think they said something during the week along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. specifically with the new Xbox series systems, mm. like they they will be able to play games from the original Xbox all the way up to current generation. That's great news. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. And I think it's pretty much all games. Um, maybe there's a few exceptions, I think, that weren't able to run on the new systems. Mm. Um, but it's ve- it's like one or two games out of all of them, which is amazing. Um, and then Nintendo have always been you know, fans of reselling their games, which is another... Specifically reselling them, yeah, but I guess they are available technically, yeah. Yeah, that is kind of a, like, grey, greyish thing, you know, it's a bit shit that, like, we have to buy the game again or whatever. But they have, um, kind of like the virtual store, like, on the Nintendo Switch now, they have Nintendo Switch Online, which includes, um, they've been, like, adding all their old games to, which you just pay a subscription for, and you can play them all, like, I think it's, like, £20 for a year. And you can have access to all these games. They keep adding more every month um, from different systems and stuff as well. And I think the, well, fans are hoping the idea is they'll eventually add like, you know, more and more modern systems to it. Like um, the GameCube and the Wii will get added there possibly as well, Mm. Um, which is great. And that's kind of, I think like um, with Nintendo Switch Online and Game Pass, like maybe that's a good route to go. Like, yes, it's a subscription service, but here you have access to all of our past content, you know? Um, and that way, like, they're making it uh, simple for consumers to access that um, those games and hopefully avoiding pir- piracy for the most part. Um, but yeah, and then when it comes to Sony, they just seem to be like completely behind on that stuff, it's which weird, is so yeah. annoying because... Up until the, funnily enough, up until the PS4, like, well, kind of around the PS3, the PS2 could play PS1 games. The PS3, some versions of it could play PS1, some versions of it could play PS2. They literally patched that out. That was what yeah. really annoyed. I, like, because they used to be able to play PS1 games and PS2 games, and then there was just an update that patched it out, the ability to do it, which is bananas. It's so, so weird. Like, I think originally... um I'm not sure if I don't think it was using emulation as a thing. I think they actually had hardware in the system. Yes, they had to. Yeah, yeah. which is fair enough because that's maybe a cost issue then for manufacturing the the mm-hmm. unit. But nowadays with emulation, though. well, yeah, I don't know. But like now nowadays with emulation though, it's it's so much easier to like you don't have to ship a, like a load of cost costly hardware. You mm. know, like just a a piece of software can emulate the system. For, especially for those older systems anyway I guess it gets a bit more complicated when you're talking about 
like PS3 or PS4 games being emulated like that because maybe they're they're too recent to do that. I don't know. But yeah. I think um, you do have a good point there about uh, it might be a good direction to go into. I remember when Netflix became a thing, showing me age here now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember I was like just completely against the whole idea of Netflix. It's like, no, I want to own my movies. You know, I want to own, and that's still the case, but you can't argue with the convenience of it. And I think that's a really key factor here because the thing is quite a lot of these games, like they will still be available in some shape or form, but it's just the convenience of how we access them is the real concern here. Mm. And um, I think Nintendo, I do think are taking a good route with it. Uh, Game Pass is good too. I feel like they're they're actually not approaching it in a smart consumer way because uh, Nintendo are drip feeding it in and that's fine because you're never going to spend all your time playing really ancient Nintendo games. But when one drops like every week or every month, you know, you get a little peak of interest every month. So it keeps you invested. Whereas with Game Pass, it's just here's everything in one go. I'm pretty sure that's, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I think that's how it works, isn't it? It's everything that we have is available here. And that's a good deal. But I think after a while, once you've played everything you think you'll want to play, you might just say, right, I'm done now. I don't need Game Pass anymore. Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure if it's, um, I, th- I think it's more so that the new systems are able to play all these previous games, like even if you have the disc and stuff, mm. and they might be on the storefront as well. I think Game uh, yeah. Pass... I think they're slowly adding more to Game Pass, so eventually it will become like the entire backlog. But I, I think right now they're not at that point yet. They're just still adding to it. Do you think that... Um, so Sony, I think you mentioned on a different podcast, Sean, that uh, Sony were doing really badly with uh, PlayStation Now because they didn't really know what they were doing with that. Do you think... I, I feel like there's been more games dropped on that lately. I feel like I've seen videos around saying this game has become available mm. on PlayStation now. Yeah. And I'm wondering, are they going to start pushing to make that their big thing? Like maybe, especially once the PlayStation 3, Vita and PSP stores close, is that going to be their big push? Um, yeah, I think they're. I think it's definitely going to go that way eventually. Um, there's definitely been a turning point, I think, recently with um with place with Sony and PlayStation now um and like th- they've probably definitely realized they're lagging behind the competition here with what Microsoft is doing with Game Pass um so i as far as their like cloud efforts go i think they're a, a good bit away from that because they don't have the the infrastructure but um definitely i think they're going to start adding more and more of their backlog on there and just hoping people subscribe to it i think the issue is not enough people really know like about playstation now and like know exactly what like, because yeah. i think they advertised it originally as oh it's a cloud service but the fact that you can subscribe to it and you get free games to download to your system like every month or whatever the same way um game pass works like with game pass you can either download the games or you can play them on the cloud it's kind of up to the consumer what they want to do um but yeah i think i think they've kind of realized they need to start going in that direction just i have a weird and this could be crazy but i have a theory about sony that there might be something a bit more cynical going on for their reason not to preserve a lot of games. Um, Because if you think of Demon's Souls, that's a game that's only available on the PS3. But then they made a really big, high-budget remake of that game that was like, maybe still is one of the best games to get on their new console. And also there's been rumours this week, I don't know if you've seen that they're going to remaster last of us again for the yes. last five i saw that that's the dumbest move <laughs> it's it's dumb it's crazy but also I'd people, say a lot of people are going to buy it on the ps5 Definitely. Um, so by withholding and limiting the amount of these old games you can get and then bringing out like remastered or just like up spec versions of them then they can charge, they can like argue that, oh, this is a new thing, so we have to charge full price for it. The problem is they're never going to do that for all the games. Though, That's it, you yeah. Know? Like, so they um, get to decide. Like this was the thing, this was the thing even back on the PS3, because I remember they'd bring out, uh, 
you know, HD collections. That got mm. that was really big at the end of the PS3's life. Yeah, like yeah. I remember seeing all these HD Metal Gear Solid, and stuff Uncharted, like that. Uh, God of War. Like I remember those ones specifically. Um, and I think Tomb Raider Anniversary or whatever they had like a triple collection for that as well. But yeah, I guess the problem is just there's n- they're never going to do this with all games, and there's going to be those like shitty little games that probably only me I like or yeah. something. Yeah. you know that are, are never going to get that treatment. Um, yeah, which sucks really. Um, I think they just need to like listen to their their fan base and their community and realize like at least give us backwards compatibility here. Do you know what I mean? Like, like fair, like because you could still like say if I was playing. If I have backwards compatibility on the PS5, it's like, cool, I'm going to play the Getaway Black Monday. I have the disc here. I can stick it in. It works. Or I can download it from the store. No problem. But then they come out next week and they're like, we're remastering the Getaway. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm buying that. You know, Or it's <laughs> yeah. like a HD collection of the Getaway. It's like, yeah, sick. All you did was like up res the, re- the graphics or whatever. But, you know, I'll still, fans of the game are going to buy that, you know? I, uh, sorry, in terms of the Getaway, I think you mean fan of the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You specifically. Yeah, very funny. Um, <laughs> but this is the thing, though, like, um, because you're, you're, you're talking about, like, remasters, but that's not preservation, though, because they're yeah, going to, like, not, tweak not. little things there. And mm. that's, this goes back to the whole thing that I was saying about remembering the mistakes of the past, because if they're just going to tweak this to make it more accessible for users, they're forgetting the mistakes that they made previously. And then mm. the whole exercise is pointless. So... Yeah, but having said that, I think you are actually right on that, Michael, because how many PS1 remasters did we see on the PlayStation 4 like over the last mm. two or three years? Medieval yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah like oh, yeah, all yeah, these. There's so many. Like, But what I suspect they're going to do, I was just looking this up now. Um, the PlayStation Now, I didn't realize this, isn't actually available on the PlayStation 5. I thought it was, but it's oh. not. So what I suspect is going to happen is once the PlayStation 3 servers are down and same for the Vita and the PSP, I suspect there's going to be a new model, a new system announced for the PS5 that will be much more accessible. Like it'll be, you know, like a slim version. Uh no, 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 no. I, like, I mean, like a service, like a PlayStation Now service. Oh, right. S- similar to PlayStation Now, they might decide to rebrand or something, but there's going to be like a committee-led analysis to make sure this is super easy to use. Even your grandma knows how to play uh <laughs> fucking i try to give an example lemmings 3d on uh, <laughs> <laughs> on your playstation 5 um that's I'm, what i'm thinking will happen because that seems like the best way to get money out of consumers just keep the su- subscription going whereas uh xbox has is it games with gold and the game pass mm. which is two separate yeah. systems and i'm wondering will they find some way to bundle it all for playstation with playstation now this hypothetical new one that I fairly convinced will come out, and um, what was, and what was I saying? Yeah, and PlayStation Plus. I think when they release this, I think they might have some kind of stimulus package where you know you'll get a discount on if you buy both of them together, and this will be mm. how you'll get like the full potential out of your PlayStation Five. Or maybe they'll just like fuse them together so you get like because like maybe they feel oh people only want to play pay one subscription to PlayStation. Mm-hmm. So if it's mm-hmm. like you get the online play and some free games plus the subscription service yeah. or the streaming service then that sort of does make more sense. That that's what they need to do bundle all together because it's funny you mention um Xbox or games with gold because that was originally their ex- Microsoft service for getting free games each month or whatever. Mm. And then they brought out Game Pass and Game Pass Ultimate, and they're trying to really push that. The problem is they have to keep games with gold going because people have subscriptions to it and stuff, like year-long subscriptions or whatever. Yeah. And But increasingly, they've been putting out really shit games on that. Like, nobody... like like games nobody wants to play whereas before they would have been giving away like good like big triple a games each month um but they're kind of trying to steer people away from that service now so they don't renew on it the weird thing with sony is though in relation to that point is the last few months they've been bringing out really big games on playstation plus yeah Uh, final fantasy 7 remake and days gone and uh control recently so maybe it's like a 
a final push to get a lot of subscribers onto that before they start to change things. Maybe. Yeah, maybe because they can bundle it together and they can just say, oh, your subscription service is changing on yeah, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Blah, you know? Yeah, your, uh, your monthly fee will rise slightly, but you'll have all these new games to play. Exactly, of. yeah. It's weird, actually, as well as this, um, not only have Sony been like knocking it out of park in terms of the free games you've, you can play on your PS4, the PlayStation 5 got the PlayStation Plus collection, mm. which was like, how many games? 12? 20? Huge amount of games. Something like oh, that, yeah. Yeah, and obviously it was a very good marketing device to make sure that anyone who got a, a PS5 would have plenty of things to play because there isn't that many things out on the PS5 uh, at the moment. Uh, really good idea because this is always the case. I remember when the PlayStation 4 came out first, there was nothing on it for the longest time and it wasn't backwards compatible. So everybody mm. was playing Octodad and Rezogun for the first uh, three months, <laughs> which was fine, great games, but um, yeah, there was nothing. But yeah, this was a really smart move. So it's funny how even though they're not doing great with backwards compatibility, they are pushing ahead in really interesting ways. Like I think they're doing a great job in the service of providing for current games. But the question is, are they going to keep going along this track and keep disregarding the stuff that they had in the past? Or will they manage to catch up with Xbox and be able to provide a good backwards compatible service as well? Yeah. That's true. But even like beyond uh, console games where we have this sort of direct lineage, you know, PS1 to 2 to 3, Xbox to Xbox One, etc. Um, Flash games. Flash, uh, the service of Flash online ended last year in 2020. Mm. So there's so many little Flash games that have been like lost forever as a result. Mm. There's been a push to preserve a lot of games as well. So I presume like they can be made in another version and sold on Steam or something like that. But so many little games like browser based games are gone. I think when it comes to that kind of stuff, like that's really down to the developer because like um flash as a service had no nothing to do with those games if you get me true so yeah. if you know like you were just using their serve it would be kind of like well no i wouldn't be like that but, uh, <laughs> yeah no it like trying to think of a, a but like i guess but, it's like it's not sony's responsibility if an ea game isn't preserved let's say yeah um yeah it would it would kind of be like if if an EA game was only on a Sony digital store mm. and Sony decided to close down that store then they should at least like say if, it, say if it was an exclusive for example then Sony should at least make an agreement with EA and say you know maybe beforehand or oh, if if our store closes you have the right to distribute this somewhere else mm. do you know because I'm sure that wasn't done with a lot of games and there's going to be plenty of games that are lost here that are still tied up legally with Sony and the developers can't do anything about it unless they renegotiate something with them but that's like it's a whole new world for that kind of thing so yeah. like all that stuff is going to be, have to be hashed out basically um, like for example um well, I just, I, I, these weren't exclusively on the digital store, but like there was, just because I was mentioned earlier, there was two Killzone games on PS Vita and PSP mm. um, that aren't, they're exclusive to Sony, so they won't be on any other console. Um, so I don't see Sony giving up the, the rights to that franchise, even though I don't know if they're going to do anything else with they it. They might but. release like a HD collection with everything on it. Yeah, they could do that on PS5. And get more money out of us again. Yeah, yeah, true. It's a really interesting topic. I think, like, it's, like I was saying, it's kind of a new world. Well, this kind of thing has always been going on, but in the digital age now, things are kind of becoming more complicated, mm. which is funny because they should be easier. But um, I guess when it comes to, yeah, like, store owners and publishers, and there's too many cooks involved when it comes to licensing issues and all that. So Yeah, true. Um, but I, I, I think... Either, like, if a developer just stops selling a game, then, you know, like, do, it's almost like, say, like I was saying earlier, if uh, Nintendo does, well, maybe they're a bad example, but, like, if um, EA or somebody says, like, yeah, we're going to, we don't want to sell this anymore, we're not going to sell it anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and then people start pirating it, or, like, let's not say that, let's say people start emulating it or something uh, on PC, 
um, should that just be allowed because you can't buy it anymore anyway? Or like, but realistically, EA are going to chase that person down and get like money off them or yeah. whatever. But I don't know. Like, it's hard to. This is a very tricky issue because for me personally, if, if a game is unavailable, like completely unavailable, and my only choice is to pirate it if I want to play it, morally, I would think that's actually okay. Because mm. if you look at it from the stance of, um, say, Sony, uh, they are making this game unavailable. So in a roundabout sort of way, the message they're kind of getting across is these games aren't worth anything anymore. So why should we pay money for a game that they consider to have no worth and not worth uh, preserving? Yeah, that's true. And yeah, it's like if you're not given any legal avenue to play a game and you want to, then like maybe there's one perspective that says tough shit. You just don't get to play that game. I get to decide. Um, But, you know, like once you release a game, it's part it's out in the ether. It's part of public life. It should be available for everyone to play yeah Yeah, it's kind of funny though because like with with digital media because you can make unlimited copies of something we're talking about like piracy being okay so if there's no other avenue but like with a physical thing if there was like a limited edition of a painting only 2000 so it's like oh well i didn't get the painting i'll (laughs) steal one (laughs) you know like you can't yeah yeah, obviously You can't do that. You can't do that. But that's but like, like <laughs> a deliberate, like uh, limited number yeah, of copies being enough. made. But it's like that Wu Tang Clan uh, album. <laughs> yeah. You only made one, and that fucking <laughs> weird. Who bought that? That pharma guy who got arrested. Oh yeah. Martin Screlly bought the only <laughs> version. <laughs> um, I forgot about that. But that's like a gimmick, I guess. Here's a question for you: Is actually so we talked about. Um, Nintendo, how they like to resell their older games. Uh, how would you feel like about pirating games that have you've already bought? Because I mean, if you've already like if you've already bought Mario sixty four, like in some cases like three times, and you have the opportunity to pirate again on a system that's just really convenient to use, I feel like part of me kind of feels like that's kind of okay you're buying the same version of a game you already have and maybe have multiple times. So If it's like the exact same game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Um, there's a DS version that's different enough that I think it warrants buying because you can play with different characters and I think there is other options available in it. Um, But yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Like, uh, they are offering lots of free upgrades now for like PS4 games that came out towards the end of its uh b- before the PS5 game they're offering like the Final Fantasy 7 remake you get a free upgrade for the PS5 version etc um i guess that one's a bit more of a gray area because it's like i just want to buy i just want it on this console for convenience cuz i use this console yeah. whereas like Technically, you could turn around per- that person and say, hey, you have a version yeah. on the N64 that you can't play. Just fucking dig it out and plug yeah. in all yeah. the games, mate. But um, definitely for games where, like, especially those ones where you need that online connection and you can't play it anymore, I think it's fair to pirate stuff like that. For a lot of this, I think, you um, see, a lot where the concern is coming from. I know it's where it came from for me. It isn't the games that are disappearing for good. It's the games that were once convenient are now going to suddenly become inconvenient to try and get my hands on. You mm-hmm. know, none of the games that are disappearing from the PlayStation Store or the Vita Store are ones that I am... and the, the ones that are disappearing and will no longer be available anywhere. Very few of those I really care about. The big ones for me, like I said, were those random JRPGs that I've always wanted to play and just never got around to buying. So that's that's my concern. Like if I'm looking, I'm looking at a list here now. Actually, here's something. I'll, I'm looking at a list of the games that are going to disappear forever from each of these stores now. Oh, Do you mind cool. if I, I read out a few and just like see if Go any of them... See if we know any of them. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm looking at them now. There's like a handful that I know, but none of them I'd be too upset. So I'll read out like a, a handful here. Uh, it's an alphabet- alphabetical order. Armageddon Riders, Blast Factor, Bomberman Ultra... 
carnivores, dinosaur hunter HD. Stop me if any of these like seem worth Bomber mentioning. Man, Bomberman Ultra seems like a big one. Man, video games have like the wackest names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it gets worse. There's one here just called Eat Them! Exclamation mark. <laughs> Funky Lab Rat. Uh, there's one on the Vita. <laughs> what was it called? Um, the HD Adventures of Rotating Octopus Character. Uh, Jesus. Oh my god, there's another These one. These are I've great never... band names. Yeah, <laughs> Jungle Rumble Freedom Happiness and Bananas. That is one. Oh my god, there's one there's one called Knob Switch. <laughs> Lick, Licky the Lucky Lizard lives again. <laughs> men's Room Mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to preserve Men's Room Mayhem. <laughs> What's that game about? Oh god. Um <laughs> Run like hell! Oh, actually, run like hell! I do know that's actually a pretty good game. Is that um, only on? Uh, I thought I heard of that somewhere else, but I think I think that might be available on all these, all three of these: the Vita, the PSP, right. and uh, so they just listed them under one. But yeah, there's not many here that are really making me go, "Oh, that's a game that we need to keep." One that's here, actually, and we mentioned it on a previous one, is Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Power Battle Cars, which oh, was no. No the very the... catchy titled precursor to Rocket League. Um, um, but that that's a great example because that's something that definitely should be preserved. Yeah, that was like a the proto version of Rocket League, which went on to be like is a huge game right now. And yeah, and now it's just it's, gone. Yeah, and that, but we like you need to see the progress. You need to see just from a historical viewpoint, or if you're a new creator and you want to make your own game, you can see their progress through and how they expanded and updated that game and made it a success probably mostly because they changed the fucking name to something that's good <laughs> but yeah that'd be such a shame to lose and like a lot of these games would be a shame to lose just another uh, just slightly changed the subject a little bit but just another thing that popped into my head there was um, even for the games that aren't digital only um, maybe like for games that are specific to these systems but aren't like there's physical versions too like eventually the hardware is going to die as well so then there's going to be way more than these 120 that will be lost mm. unless they're ported to another system because like the PS1 for example is how old now like 25 years old or more um, like that's becoming the the um the reader in that like the laser um infrared reader or mm. whatever they're like kind of notorious for breaking and they only have a finite life as well mm. and so eventually like they're like no ps1s are going to be left at work but unless like somebody continues to manufacture that part which maybe somebody will but it's kind of unlikely to well especially to be able to find one anyway if somebody is making them um so like yeah, there's just just popped into my head that there's going to be like so many more games that are lost that are maybe physical versions as well. Yeah, you know, that's the, why we need to digitize things and put them online. But then, but then you close down the store and yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, the, we need to like porting. Porting should become standard, I think, for like for these developers and stuff. Reasonably priced porting. Yeah, yeah. you definitely should not have to pay like thirty quid for a game that was available for twenty quid. You know, back when it was revealed, yes. released, that should never be standard practice. No, and I, I guess, I guess it comes down to uh, how easy it is to port, because like some ports do take quite a while, and that's kind of fair enough. Then, like they're they've spent a lot of money to port the game, but um, like I, I think that really comes down to system developers then to make it easier, possibly if if that's possible, to make it easier for developers to port their games. Mm. Do you know what's funny then in that case? Like as bad as Sony is doing, then Nintendo really fucked themselves up yeah. with the Wii. Because like, how are you supposed to port some Wii games like in the future, like to anything? Yeah. Like I I'm mean, trying. Yeah. Like I remember when um, they announced the 3D All Stars uh, Mario games. I remember thinking, how are they going to do Mario Galaxy with all the Wii mote waggling stuff that you had to do? Like they had to do some technical wizardry to get that game working, and they actually got working pretty well. But there's some games that are entire. Like how how are you going to re-release uh, WarioWare on the Wii in future generations? You know. Yeah, that's and that it's a particular problem for Nintendo, I think, because a lot of their games rely on peripherals and stuff like that. But any games that rely on that sort of thing are hardware dependent. 
guys, I just realized Donkey Konga is going to be so hard <laughs> to play in the future. I, oh my God. Because like, it's sacrilege oh. to play that on anything but the official Congas. None of these third party Mad Cats Congas, okay? Mad Fuck cats. that shit. <laughs> they don't even have third party Congas, if you can believe that. Oh. <laughs> I'm God, so, there's a market there. Oh, I'm in. so upset by that. Honestly, like I'm genuinely upset by this. <laughs> Donkey Lost. Konga lads. Oh. Wait, but you weren't you saying you can use the like taiko drums? In the rain. You can use the, <laughs> can you not can you use the taiko drums? I've um, never to, I've never actually like they have that taiko game for the Switch, but I've never played I can't imagine it being any good because you need the feedback of like the drum itself to know how good you're doing. No, but you they know? sell drums for it. They do not, do they? Yeah, there's a there's a taiko drum kit you can get for it. I'm I'm gonna look this up. Nintendo, now what are you doing with your first <laughs> <Taiko, laughs> Seriously. Taiko no Tatsujin drums. Oh my god. Um, yeah, Seriously. And here they are. Oh my god, three hundred and eighty dollars. Wait. Affordable ports is what we were talking about before. But I mean if you could play Don if you could play Donkey Kong on the Taiko uh the ta- Tycho drums, worth it. Hundred percent worth it. Yeah, I'm gonna send you a link to a picture which <laughs> we may or may not have on screen. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, I'll put it on screen. Um, but uh, yeah, there's like three different size drums you can get, and the biggest one is three hundred and eighty dollars, which is pretty crazy. That's probably the size of the ones you see in the arcades, like the ones that are actual, realistically sized. That's insane. Um, I don't think I've ever seen like Tycho drums in an arcade. Maybe in Japan, though, it's different. It, it is. Every different. controller <laughs> is a drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Time, time crisis. Time crisis. <laughs> yeah. They are. It's, I don't think I've ever been in an arcade that, did, that didn't have the Taiko drumming machine. So, yeah, it's, it's fairly common. So, do you, like, I mean, you were saying, Sean, that um, porting should become standard practice. And I think you're right, 100%. But do you think it'll ever get to a case that... Um, that like we'll just have one system with like all the game, like this ideal scenario, or is it an ideal scenario, or is that a bad scenario? I just I'm thinking of the way uh, Netflix started and is continuing now because when that came out first, Netflix was the the only name in the game. You know, everybody mm. who was streaming anything, they were using Netflix, and for the longest time, it looked like this is just the way things are going. Now we'll use Netflix to watch stuff, and that's it. Suddenly. How many streaming services have we got now? Oh God, too, too many, many now. Way yeah. too many. And no one has time for that. And this is my worry. This is what's going to happen because this is what's happening with gaming now because each of those three consoles has them. And there's more, I think. There's more, obviously, that have streaming services. They have, um, oh, what's the one that you play, Sean? The, um, Stadia. Stadia, yeah. Yeah, well, I think like just to, like when you talk about Netflix and Spotify as well is a good example. Like they, even though there are other services for streaming music and streaming films and TV or whatever, I think they both of them have monopolies. Uh, really, like well, maybe more so Spotify has a monopoly. I, I'd say over Netflix. Spotify but Netflix, would, I but think Netflix yeah. is a little more. Mm, yeah, I'd still too. say Netflix is the leader with it. Definitely, um, and that mostly comes down to their first party content. Mm. But um, or their original content. You see it. Disney Plus coming out with well, so yeah. many shows that people really want, and that would be my counter argument to the like the ideal one console or one streaming service because I think while it is annoying to have to pay for separate things, a bit of competition is really good as well. Yeah, because it pushes. That's the reason we're getting all these fucking free games from Sony. Yeah, they wouldn't be doing this if there was only Playstations in the wild. There, there's always going to be exclusives, um, even in when as we move into the streaming world. Like, mm. so you know, Sony's going to keep their exclusives, Microsoft's going to keep theirs, um, and it, I, I guess yeah, it's just going to be kind of a Netflix, Disney, Amazon situation where you got to pick one or pick them all if you have the money. But, yeah. like, but who has the um, money is the thing. Like, yeah, I know it's tough. Um, Although I'd say uh, Willow Smith. Has the money? Willow he, Smith. Willow Smith. Yeah. Is that his daughter? Is it? Yeah. Oh. Named after him in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can do uh, basically what a lot of households do with like the likes of Netflix or um, Disney Plus, where one member of the family subscribes to one, another member subscribes to another, and then everyone in the family can enjoy all of them. 
I guess well, I'll get my Ma on Game Pass. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, just because I, I play Stadia, um, they really? do they do have a, a family share um, thing where basically you can say I can buy a game, Michael can set up an account, and I can add him to my family group, and then he can play all my games basically. Um, which is pretty cool. Obviously, you you can't play the same game at the same time though, because you would need two copies for that. But um, but it's digital. Yeah, it's digital. <laughs> but like, it's not like we we have to share the disc. Yeah, but I mean, this is their way of like you you can't have your cake and eat it. You know, I it's want like, my cake. I, and I eat. can I can lend you a game. Like, say say I bought the physical copy. And it's like here, do you want to play this for the weekend? Here you go. I can't play it now because you have it. So it's the same thing yeah, in the digital world. That's yeah. because it's physical. <laughs> I know I know why they did it, but like Yeah, because it's it fair. Sucks. Like yeah, it does suck, but it's still fair. You didn't pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I didn't buy Doom Eternal Sean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um yeah, I don't think just to go back to your initial question, Steve, I don't think there's ever gonna be like one console to rule them all. There's always gonna be this competition, I think. Um but yeah, it probably will move over to the cloud, which um which w- I think like I think we all agree that's kind of the future because like gaming is really the one last area to fully transition to that in mm-hmm. a way. I mean, I know people still buy DVDs and like records and stuff, but they're in a minority, I'd say, compared to like the amount of people that use Netflix and other streaming services. So eventually gaming will go that way. It's probably just going to take a few more generations um, to As get the there. infrastructure and like internet connections and stuff get better. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I'd say with younger generations of um, like kids and stuff, do you know, like they're going to be like, oh, I'm streaming my film, streaming my music, why don't I just stream my game? Like it'll more and What's more... What's this round thing I have to put <laughs> in yeah. the TV? Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll more and more become um, the popular thing to do, I mm-hmm. think. Um, but like right now, like uh, hardware manufacturers are still selling their flashy boxes and it's like the big consumer product to have... Um, just like a phone is or, you know, headphones or anything like that. So right now, people are still going to gravitate towards the physical thing. That That is a good way to um, to help, like, solve the preservation issue in a way. Like, I guess you'd still have to port to these cloud systems, but it would be a lot easier than, like, distributing stuff physically or even digitally because you only need to have one copy of the game on mm. a server and everyone can access it, you know? Yeah, it, it's definitely how I see it going. There, there is a slight chance, I think, that they might uh, revert back to the old model of just selling digital copies again for this uh, console generation, but I think this will be the last one they do it for if they do. Yeah. Um, like, I'd say... I feel like once they shut down the PS3 servers, because Sony, generally speaking, they tend to have a fairly fairly good idea of what consumers want. Like if they make a mistake, they're usually pretty good at backtracking. There's some like, um, I'm trying to think what was the example I had in mind. The PS3 launch in general. Was yeah, so, like, yeah, they, they improved. Disaster, on, yeah. yeah, they improved on that over time. But I think once they shut down these stores, the biggest loss for a lot of people, I think, so I'd say for me anyway, and I'm sure probably for you guys as well, is uh, the likes of the PlayStation 1 games and PlayStation 2 games. They're probably the things that are really going to hit hard. And because of that, I think they're probably going to do something to bring that onto the PS5. I can't see them just letting go of those because they know they'll sell. Even if it's a case of, hey, we're releasing these games again and uh, we're charging a small amount so you can buy it again. Even if they had that, people will complain, but they'll also still be a little bit uh, relieved because they'll know the option is there. Yeah, and people will buy them again. Like if you look at Nintendo with the Nintendo Switch um, store, you know, like they're pumping their old games out on there and people are lapping it up. You know? I, I would, lo- like I was saying, I'd want to play the old Final Fantasy games. Um, recently I was like, oh, I might download, you know, um, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. No, can't do it on a PS4. Yeah. Now it is on PS Now, I think. So in fairness, like I can go and spend that extra money there, but I just wanted it. The convenience you know? of getting it on the PS4. I just wanted to right? own it on this console, you know? Honestly, yeah. I think if they went the way of Nintendo, they it would just be an absolute winner with the, you know, the subscription service and releasing yeah. like a game every month because I know they already have 
the um, PlayStation Plus where they're revealing like modern games, but they had like retro PlayStation Plus or something like that. And they just released like three games every month. That would be gold. Because if you knew there was a selection of three PS1 games coming into your library every single month, people would play those. Like it, mm. it's the kind of thing you'd look at and says, oh, I saw that, but I never played it. I'd love to give that a mm. go. Like people would mm. get so on board with that. I know I would. Yeah, that would be really good. Actually, that just reminded me, um, the Nintendo Online service actually isn't a streaming service you need to download those but because they're like NES they're so and SNES small. games they're so small in size but I guess PS1 games would be a little bit bigger so eventually that download size is going to get huge but maybe you could pick and choose like what you want even getting to PS2 games though the biggest PS2 games wouldn't be that big you know? no probably not because they were on DVD weren't they mm. and the limit on that was like 4.7 gigs or something i think on a dvd yeah something like that i think i think it was was one of the socom games was like the biggest one of those or something i don't know we'll um, look that up well i well fair yeah, play I'm to you sure. if you know the file size off the top <laughs> of your head of a socom game <laughs> i'm not sure because like the ps the ps3 was the first console where you had to install the games wasn't mm. it PS2, you didn't have to do no. that. So it had to be all on the disc. And mm. there was no storefront to download stuff. Mm. So, yeah. It's mad to just think how far we've come. But like, um, God, Dude. I miss the old days sometimes. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Apparently the biggest uh, PlayStation 2 game in terms of file size was Xeno Saga Episode 1, which was 8 gigabytes. Wow. Oh, Wow. Well, Pretty that's big. definitely bigger. I uh, know, actually, yeah, I think I was wrong. A DVD is like seven point something gigs, is it? So how did they do that? Well, they could spread it across a few discs. Oh, so yeah, yeah you put in the to. second. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember you had to do that, like put in this disc two now, mm. and it would like freeze the game. I don't remember ever doing that on PlayStation 2, though. There's not that many. Like, there's about four, ga- like, what what's the file size of DVD? Seven? I think it's seven point something. Yeah, let me just check that. Um, there's like I think there, I think it's here I can see like a handful of games it's something like 10 games they have Xenosaga something called Champions of Norath uh, the Japanese all JRPGs <laughs> yeah the Japanese version of Gran Turismo concept that's weird uh, Japanese Xenosaga USA version of God of War huh wow okay wouldn't have thought that and Metal Gear Solid 2 for some reason oh wait did that come on two discs no, well, I remember it having a... It had an extra disc or something, didn't it? A D, no, that was full of like, um, you know, behind the scenes of making of, well, the version I had anyway, but I can't remember if the base game came over maybe, two discs. Maybe it was like, a, like they're combining both of those disc size, like, you know, the concept art and the other thing, and that's why it's up here. Oh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. So, maybe. Sorry, I just looked it up, but the PS2 actually used CDs and DVDs, but there's two versions of DVDs. There's a single layer, which is 4.7 gigs, and then a dual layer, which is 8.5 gigs. Jesus, you uh, were on the money with your 4.7. Yeah, so I guess the um, that Xenoverse thing or whatever you said, that must have used the dual layer, which is 8.5. Yeah, so these are all divided. That bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she can't take any more. <laughs> Yeah, so I think we might have covered everything, unless there's anything else you guys want to say on on the matter. I think we solved it. We so, we <laughs> solved games preservation. It's all fine. Pirate everything, guys, and it'll be no problem. Just, just no, let all games die apart from that uh, mayhem in the men's room. <laughs> whatever it was called. <laughs> yeah. Men's room mayhem. Oh, Men- yeah. <laughs> men's room mayhem is a big one, yeah. Okay, well, listen, uh, that was great. But before we go, let's ask our usual question. <sighs> where can we get a copy of Donkey Konga? Like, uh, like where? I need to know. What level of Donkey Konga were you playing this week, guys? <laughs> yeah. Sean, let's throw it to you. What have you Ooh. been playing this week? Um, so I just actually completed Rage 2. Hey! <laughs> Interesting. How long did it take um, you? Um, it not well annoyingly um, I was going to talk about a different game but I may as well talk about Rage 2 um, annoyingly there's a, a bug in the game on the last mission that's been there ever since now the game's only like 2018 so it's not even that old mm. but um, there's a bug in the game that people have been complaining about online since it released and they still haven't patched it and it seems like Bethesda have just dropped all support or sorry 
Not Bethesda. Bethesda um, published it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like they've dropped support for the game anyway um, because loads of people are still complaining about it online. Um, and basically the bug is when when you, you have to like basically complete a few like prerequisites to unlock the marker for the final mission. And once you unlock the marker... If you say, oh, I, I'm I'm going to leave that mission for a little bit, I want to power up a bit before I go to it, um, there's a very good chance the marker will disappear and never reappear. So you can never do the final mission unless you reload to like a previous save. And it happened to me. And I was oh. like, what? That's really weird. And I was like, it'll come back. <laughs> it'll come back. <laughs> so like I did like loads of stuff like fast traveling and all this that people were saying online fixes it, and it just didn't. So I ended up having to like load a save and like do a load of missions again. But luckily the luckily the main campaign for that's actually really quick. Like I'd say you c- could complete the main campaign in like three to four hours. Oh. But they add loads of like side quests in and um a lot of padding some people like kind of like Mad Max where like there's checkpoints and all stuff that you can clear out and hide mm. outs and stuff there's a load of that stuff you can do but when that and I was gonna do it I was like really into the game I was like I'm gonna 100% it but when that happened I was like fuck this I'm just <laughs> like I'm loading that save getting that final mission and I'm done so like but it, it was it was a fun game to be honest like um, I think I think it was, I wouldn't say it was underrated. I think it deserved its like mediocre ratings. Because Six, seven out of ten. Yeah, like the gameplay is very fun. The story is meh, to be honest, and it's pretty short. But like, if you just want like a kind of a mindless uh, open world shooter, like first person shooter, kind of in like Bulletstorm slash Doom style, mm. then it's like, it's good fun for that, I'd say. Um, and maybe someday I will go back and play the DLC or something, but I just kind of got sick of it after, like, because I the thing is I pumped so many hours into it, like doing all the side bits. I didn't realize the main story was like so short, and then I was like, "Well, I'm literally at the last mission already," and it bugged out on me. So I was just like, "Let's finish this," and I'm done. So yeah, just finish Rage Two. I won't say what I'm playing at the moment. I'll leave that for another one. Ooh, spicy. Yeah. Sorry, you said Rage Two. I yeah. thought you said uh, I thought you said Red Dead Redemption too, and I was like, I'm pretty sure it wasn't that short. I There's it was a lot like, more words in that title. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, that makes so much sense now. <laughs> well, Red, Red Dead Two is there as well. I've just put it on the back burner for a while. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, that's cool. So, um, nice. Uh, what are you playing at the moment, there, Michael? Um, at the moment, I'm playing Disco Elysium, oh. and it's fucking sick. It is so good. But, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> it's almost similar to Sean. Backstory, I played Disco Elysium in 2019 um, in Dalston in London here before it came out at this like Ooh. indie game no it, it, Ooh, you know. behind closed doors <laughs> um at, like there's an indie game event here in london um for games week or something like that um and there was in a pub load of little different indie games you could play and i went up and played a few minutes of disco elysium i was like oh this is sort of cool um but literally five minutes in it crashed uh. and so i sort of the developers were like right beside me when I crashed and they were like looking awkwardly and they were like, oh, let's, and he took a minute and he did something and then it came back up and I could play it again and I was sort of like, nah, I'll leave it. <laughs> it's cool. And you could see like they were disappointed. Like, Fuck you. <laughs> but, um, and then it came out like a year later and was like the most critically acclaimed game that year. And they have a little um, subtitle, Fuck you, Michael, for not finishing our game. <laughs> <laughs> 10 out of 10 from age IGN. Suck on that. <laughs> the anger gave them the energy to complete the game and make it brilliant. Um, but then, unfortunately, when I was like, I don't know, five, six hours into playing the game this time, um, it crashed again and oh, corrupted no. all my saves. <sighs> Shit. So I had to start the entire thing again, um, which was very frustrating because one of the mechanics is luck based in the game. So <gasps> oh, man. you have a dice roll on a lot of decisions in the game. And I had got some good luck on my first round that I didn't get in my second. Um but it sort of reveals something amazing about the game in that like there's so many different avenues that conversations can go down that I didn't even realize existed. 
Um, but it's it's really cool, really well written. Um, this I'm playing the Final Cut version, which released on PS4, and that added voice acting, which is amazing. It, it really suits it. I can't imagine the game without voice acting. Um, great art style, great writing, um, really fantastic world building as well. I don't want to say too much because I I genuinely think both of you should play it. Yeah. But one thing I'll say to sell it is within. 10 to 15 minutes of me starting the game, I had um, talked to a drug addicted uh, 12 year old kid and punched him in the face. <laughs> wow. Um, just like Ballin you, Wonderland. <laughs> just like yeah. Ballin Wonderland. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's sick. I'm really enjoying it. That sounds Class. really good. Um, yeah, no, I think I'm definitely planning on playing that as well. Um, it's funny actually uh, when you were saying Sean about Rage 2 which I now realise was Rage 2 that uh, <laughs> it's kind of a 7 out of 10 game and like it's kind of fun to while away the hours you know every mm. time I hear a review like that if I'm kind of on the fence of whether or not to get it I always say no because it'll probably come out on PlayStation Plus at some stage and that's a, a <laughs> yeah. weird that's a weird effect that's, that that's had on players now that like you're only going to get the games that you desperately want to play you're never mm. going to play the the games that you kind of want to play because it might mm. be free later um, yeah that's true uh, cuz i actually have the same mentality on Stadia because they give away like a few free games with pro every month and usually like I'll see a game get released on it and be like, that'll definitely be a free game. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'll try it yeah. at that stage. Yeah. That's what? sort of how I feel about Ghost of Shishima, actually. Oh, really? It looks cool and I'd like to play it, but I would... Do you think it'll be free? It'll eventually yeah, be free. Yeah, they released Final Fantasy Remake and Days mm. Gone, so maybe in like, I don't know, a year it'll be on... Maybe. Yeah. Plus. Maybe. Um, Steve, what are you playing? Uh, so I am taking a very important one off the list. I'm playing Dark Souls 3 now at the moment. Oh, cool. Nice. Um, I am feeling very good about this now because I've been wanting to finish off the Dark Souls trilogy for a while. Have to say, I love the overall direct... After playing this now, I haven't finished it yet, but after playing a lot of it, I love the entire arc of the Dark Souls trilogy because mm. each game is has a very unique flavor to it, which you wouldn't believe. Like, Sean, I'd say you said before, had they all looked the same. And I imagine it's kind of hard to see how there's a major difference, but each one does have a very unique feel to it um, mm. after playing this. Because, like, the first one is its own thing. The second one is very different. Like, they... they um, well, first of all, the enemies are a lot more unfair, which, weirdly enough, I kind of like in retrospect. Um, uh, and this one, it's definitely going back to formula a little bit. It's a lot more like the first one, but they tweak stuff. So mechanically, it's a lot more interesting. Um, hmm. The only problem with it is, and I'm not sure if this is how the game was made or just because I've played so many of these games now, it is very easy comparatively. Uh, I think mm. I think that might just be because I've played so many of these at this point, but um, I haven't really struggled with any of the bosses. There's one that took me a couple of goes, but uh, for the most part, yeah, it's just been... It's weird. You find a lot of Souls veterans have that attitude. They get to like the newer releases and they're sort of like, ah, it, it was cool, but it was just a little easy because... I think it's because you have to learn how to play these games differently that once you learn and unlock that, it's not that they're like, you know, free and you can just walk through them, but they do, the the insane challenge that was there for the first one isn't there anymore. Yeah, but it is fun though, because um, the first time you play it when you have no idea how to play, the most significant factor, the unique selling point does seem like the difficulty. But once you've learned the game, it is the actual explore, exploration, which is what, you know, yes. all these reviewers say, like, this is the point of it. And like a lot of people always think, oh, you're talking out your arse. It's just really hard. But it is actually like, it is the expo exploration and the characters in the world, the atmosphere, all of these things feed into it. And it's really, really good. And you're right about, you do have to learn the game because I remember at one point, I think after I played Dark Souls, I said, I'd get uh, Ninja Gaiden because that was another game I heard was really hard. And I was like, well, if I mm. finish Dark Souls, this will be a piece of cake. Christ almighty, that game is hard. <laughs> that I, have you guys ever played the Ninja Gaiden games? No, no. I've watched some, uh, I think I put a clip from that in our Bloodborne video. So I watched some Let's Plays of it recently. And I was like, insane. 
the amount it's, of stuff you have to deal with at any one time. It's 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 a very different type of difficulty. Like mm. uh, I think Dark Souls has oppressive difficulty, so it feels hopeless. But like you can take a breather. You can't do that in Ninja Gaiden. You have to. You just have to be a ninja, lightning fast, or you're dead. So naturally, I'm get I'm getting the trilogy when it comes out because uh, I'm going to go back to it, give it another go. I'd actually love uh, to see what you think of uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Steve, because it's got that kind of combat. Like, yeah, wait, the really fast one, like from Ninja Gaiden. No, no, it's no Souls like no, the, the, the oh, Souls like yeah. one. Uh, yeah. Just to see kind of what you think, because you're like after playing the Souls games, what you think of the combat in it. Yeah, but, um, yeah. If you ever get around to it, let me know, and we'll have a debate on it. <laughs> which which is the Star Wars uh, The Evil Within a good survival horror game <laughs> um, and also uh, Sekiro um, mm. I'm looking forward yeah. to see what you think of that because it does change things up uh, mechanically I think even more than Bloodborne did so you have to develop a different muscle let's say someone told me that the big, a big issue with that is there's specific uh, symbols that you have to react to but, yeah, it's, uh, it's all about parrying and the symbols would make it easy in some ways because they're, they're quite easily, like visually to see them, but it's, you can't play it defensively, if you get me. Yeah, I, I remember someone told me that um, the symbols are kind of okay, but if you can't read them, then it's, you know, it's kind of trickier than it needs to be. But I was thinking, I was looking at a Let's Play of that and I actually... I can I can understand each of the symbols now. So I'm like, I wonder if this will make it easier or will it have any difference at all when I play? <laughs> oh, you mean you can understand like the kanji or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just like knew, oh, that one means jump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you get, I mean, are they color coded, the kanji? E, I don't know, I think they're all red, actually. That makes it really, that's a weird decision. Why wouldn't they color code it? But like, it's it's generally like you have to do something here. It's the same as like, you have to learn a boss's like wind up animation in Dark Souls to know what sort of attack it's going to pull. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, it'll be worth checking out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ringing endorsement there. Yeah. Um, well, hey, it, w- it won game of the year last year. So, um, but then it did. No, oh, it's wow. sick. I really like Sekiro. Um, yeah. I just need to go back and finish it. But man, I'm not in the mood. I actually tried <laughs> to start Dark Souls 3 around a month ago. Oh, yeah? And I got a little, like, I didn't. I think I played it for like 15 minutes. I was like, I am not in the mood for this sort of game right now. <laughs> I hate that when you just you pick up something and you're like, nah. So I think I played like all those new PlayStation games that were free, like uh, Res. Oh, I saw. Like I, I think I saw you playing some of those actually. Yeah. Were there any good they're ones out of that? Well, they're also like Tumpers in there. Um, uh, uh, as as Abzu. Abzu, that's really good. Um <laughs> What else? Uh, Subnautica. Res. Subnautica. Yeah, I played that for a bit as well. It's cool. It's uh, it's crazy how little it tells you at the beginning. I know a lot of survival games do that, but it was sort of like, yeah, you deal with it. You know. <laughs> all right. Well, um, sick. I guess uh, that's all we really need to talk about. I think we're done and dusted. So, uh, everyone listening at home, uh, what do you think about games preservation? Do you think piracy is the way to go? Do you think? Sony will go the way of Nintendo or will they have a new PlayStation now? What What's going to happen? You tell us. We're not here to tell you. Like, that's not our job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so listen, uh, like, subscribe uh, our YouTube page. Listen to us on Spotify, on Anchor FM, all of those. And I guess... Hit that bell. Hit that bell. <laughs> get the likes. Absolutely obliterate that like button. Yeah. yeah. Can we get 9,000 likes, guys? 9,000 likes on this <laughs> That's all. That's all we're looking for. <laughs> Any more and it's ruined. Yeah. We will personally send you a copy of Men's Room Mayhem for every like that we <laughs> yeah. get. Go. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.